Thank you very much, Tim. Thank you very much, Alessandro and Fernando, for the invitation to give this talk. And I would like to um, explain more details uh, the work that I've done with Rafael Montezuma, and which I talked a little bit about during the short talks. Um, so picking up a hint dropped by Evgeny, I would like to start stating a theorem that we all learn to love, which is uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> which is the Hirsch theorem. Okay. Hirsch theorem. So Hirsch theorem is a theorem about um, matrix on the two sphere. It's a theorem about the first uh, eigenvalue of the Laplace operator on those spheres. And of course, I mean the first non-trivial eigenvalue. And the theorem says us, tells us um, a sharp upper bound for lambda 1 among all matrix with the same volume. So a nice way to write down it is in terms of inequality, saying that lambda 1 times the area, which is the right uh, scaling invariant quantity, is at most equal to 8 pi. Moreover, equality characterizes um, the round sphere. with constant Gaussian curvature. OK, so I don't want to do the proof, but I want to highlight a certain aspect of this inequality. So we can see here it's an inequality relating the area, the total volume of your surface, and a number that has a variational aspect. So let me. Uh, develop on this, so let me recall that on any closed manifold, uh, the first eigenvalue of the Laplacian has a variational characterization in terms of the highly quotients. So, if we pick if we pick a f smooth function uh, that's not zero, and if we can compute uh, the highly quotient with respect to the metric, which is the Dirichlet energy divided by the L2 norm. <coughs> uh, so this is the highly quotient. Then lambda 1 is the infimum of those numbers, uh, taking this infimum taking over the set of functions with zero average. OK, Okay. so lambda 1 is variational. But this characterization is not so m maybe a bit misleading. Because lambda 1 is not actually a minimum. It's actually a min max critical value. So let me explain how to see this. Um, so let's imagine that this is my set of functions. So this is my set of constant functions. This line, the orthogonal complement, is a set of functions wi with zero average. And let's imagine I have a path of functions starting from the constant function minus 1 and going to the constant function 1. OK? So, uh, so let me write down here the family. Uh, <coughs> family, uh, phi, phi uh, minus 1, say, is equal to minus 1, and then phi 1 is equal to 1, for t between minus 1 and 1. Uh, and so this family always passes through a function with zero average. So if I compute the maximum of the high leg quotient in this family, I'm sure to get 
a number that is bigger than lambda 1. Okay? And I will leave you as a nice exercise to show that equality holds when you take the infimum of all such families. Okay? So, in other words, uh, this inequality is an equality between the element volume and a mean max critical value of a natural geometric uh, functional. And this is the beginning of the story because now we have a very well developed theory or very well developed theories to find mean max critical values or mean max critical points of the area function, right? There are several options, several flavors, each one with uh, advantage and disadvantages. Uh, so to develop the theory that I want to explain, I will choose uh, the Simon Smith mean max approach. So max uh, width of three spheres. OK, so let me define what is the functional uh, or the invariant. So let's take uh, the rounds here in the Euclidean space. And let, let us consider the following family of surfaces defined by the intersection of S3 with the horizontal planes. So those are two spheres at constant height. And as I mentioned in my short talk, uh, this family defines a very nice um, sweep out of the two sphere, in the sense that it starts at a, the trivial sphere, a point which has zero area. Uh, it sweep outs all regions of the sphere and ends up again at a point. So this particular family, I will call the canonical sweep out, the uh, standard sweep out. OK, and then I can deform this particular family by taking isotopies. So if I consider a one-parameter family of different morphisms um, from S3 to S3, uh, a family of diffuse, each one uh, isotopic to the identity. So they are obtained by the flow of vector fields. Well, given such family, I can define a new sweep out by taking sigma s. Well, let me change the parameter, sorry. So this is s between minus 1 and 1. So now I take the image of the s slice of the standard sweep out. OK, so in pictures, I uh, will change my base point, maybe. And then uh, we see lots of other two spheres. They might intersect themselves because the diffu is changing. But anyway, they will be also sweeping out the two spheres. OK, this is an admissible sweep out. Right, and now we'll define our min max invariant. So given any Riemannian metric on the trees here, uh, for each admissible family, we compute the maximum of the area of the slice um, with respect to the given metric. 
and then we take the infimum. <coughs> okay, so since every admissible family has a slice that divides the sphere into two pieces of the same volume, you can use the isoperimetric inequality to show that this number is non-trivial, it's positive. And also, you can compute, for example, since you know the equator in the round metric is an isoperimetric surface, which is a, ma a slice of maximum area of some sweep out, it's easy to show that uh, the width of the round metric is equal to the area of the equator, which is 4 pi. OK, so I want to interpret this as some sort of eigen uh, value. And what should be the eigen, please? Is it that easy to prove that thing if you don't know that the width is achieved by a minimal surface? I didn't use, because I, I used the solution of the isoperimetric problem. Mm -hmm. So every, so for, for every family, this number is at least 4 pi. Because 4 pi is the oh, least area of yeah. a surface, yeah. Oh, I see. And then you have a particular sweep out. Okay, okay. Yeah, but you need to know the solution to the isoperimetric problem. Okay. Right. So, but going back to the analogy, so this is the eigen value. Sorry, and I want to discuss what should be the eigen functions, right? So, what should be the objects somehow realizing the eigen? Value. So what I want to remark now is that um, this infimum is achieved is achieved precisely uh, by by the first eigen functions. <coughs> Solutions to the equation. non-trivial solutions to that equation. And actually, if you compute the derivatives, you can check that uh, the eigenfunctions are the critical points of the high leg function. So in other words, the first eigenfunctions are the critical points of the high leg functional associated to the critical level defined by lambda 1. Okay. So the analogs here should be some critical points of the area functional whose volume is equal to the value of omega. Right? So this is an analogy to have in mind. So I will state this in a rigorous way as a Bing-Max theorem. Uh, but let me remark that. Um, we should not expect to find a single minimal surface realizing the width, right? Because the space of minimal, the space of embedded two spheres in S3, um, in which we want to define the area functional, should be enlarged to allow certain degenerations, right? So if you take two spheres and join by a thin neck, you also have a two sphere. And if the neck is getting thinner and thinner, you convert to two disjoint spheres, and the area converges as well. Okay? Or you could add this thing neck and make them closer together, so that in the end I get a single sphere with multiplicity. Right? So, but anyway, doing this enlargement, um, the, the theory makes sense. So let me state the result. Uh, given any Riemannian 3 sphere, uh, um, that exists um, a collections of um, smooth embedded uh, minimum two spheres. sigma 1 to sigma k, and of integer numbers, positive integers, 1 and k, 
such that uh, the width of this Riemann tree sphere is exactly equal to uh, the area of those two spheres uh, computed with multiplicity. Okay, I'm forgetting to say that those those minimal two spheres are mutually disjoint. Right, so this statement was proven by Simon Smith. But nowadays we have a very important complement due to Marx and Nevis, which tells us more about the multiplicity and about the index of those uh, spheres. So the complement says, th says that um, as you expect by doing a min max in one parameter, the index of this object should be at most one. So if you sum index, index sorry, is that right? And so let me change the notation. So index is at most one. And well, so that is, well, the index is a non-negative number, right? So it's 0 or 1. And that is at most 1 with index 1. And this guy with index 1 must appear with multiplicity 1. OK? OK. OK, so for the sake of the talk, it's going to be useful to introduce a, a geometric condition on S3 that somehow simplifies this statement. So this condition I will call the property uh, star is the following. So I want to assume that um, S3 with this metric, so it's a property of the metric G, it contains no uh, stable or index 0 uh, embedded minimal uh, two series of area below this threshold given by the width. OK? So, uh, yes? Uh, no, for one parameter families, uh, I understand you can do Simon Smith and get the index estimate for no, one parameter families. The sign, the ah, the multiplicity. Yeah, the multiplicity. Ah, it's open. Oh, maybe I'm misquoting, huh? Ah, I see. Oh, OK, so maybe this part is still ongoing. <laughs> but this is expected, right? Yeah. yeah. OK. OK, so let's. But it, it will not affect what I'm going to tell you next. Because when we do this assumption, right? So by the way, examples, very natural examples of metrics satisfying the properties star are metrics with positive Ricci curvature. Uh, because they look convex, right? So they have no stable minimum two spheres and, uh, at all. And as Bill Mix was telling us the other day, homogeneous metrics on S3 also do not admit stable minimum two spheres. Okay. And so wha why is this hypothesis uh, interesting? Because, well, first of all, it tells us that I cannot find um, two disjoint minimum two area less or equal than the value of the width. Because if I could find these, those two disjoint ones, they would define a region, and I could minimize and find in the isotope class of one of the components of the boundary and find a sphere with less area, contradicting 
which is stable, right? So uh, an area minimizing sphere with less area contradicting the assumption. Okay, so this is uh, the first point which Sorry. somehow rules out Sorry. the joint collections. Again, I, I'm a little bit confused between the logical relation between what you just said and the Frankel property. The Frankel property, sure. so this is kind of a restricted Frankel property for minimal surface that have area less or equal than the value of the width. Okay, so for example, the minimal surface that appear in this theorem have area less or equal than the width, right? So what I'm saying that under this assumption star, I cannot find more than one. Because if I found more two of them, they would bound a region. They would act as barriers for a minimization problem. And I take a one component, it has less area than omega. I decrease the area until the minimum, find a stable minimum sphere with area less than uh, but w. it's only interesting in the, in the world where star holds but without rich positive, right? So, so your yeah, exactly, your exactly, exactly. Exactly, field. exactly. By the way, there are homogeneous metrics that do not have positive riches, so okay. this condition really talks about more metrics than positive rich metrics. Okay, so more or less, I try to convince you that under this assumption, no um, no disjoint union can appear in this theorem, right? The other thing is the multiplicity. So th the multiplic then, I then we, using the argument uh, that uh, Fernando and Andrea used in the Duke paper, um, you can show that any unstable, well, any two sphere of area less than W is unstable, and it will belong to a sweep out that has the following property. So this maximum slice of this sweep out is exactly the area of the given minimal surface. OK, so each minimal surface of area less or equal than w produces a demissible sweep out that allows us to test, to, uh, to test this number, right? And because of that, we can rule out multiplicity. So the end of the story is this statement, uh, which is a bis, so a second statement. Okay. So if S3G satisfies star, then there exists uh, embedded minimum to a sphere of index equal to 1 and area equal to the value of omega. OK. So. Yeah, just uh, maybe I will use the following terminology. So maybe we say that any, I will call any sphere uh, satisfying the conclusions, I will call um, a mean max sphere. Okay. Okay, any questions so far? So <coughs> before I continue, let, let me maybe pose a, a, a conceptual observation. So the Simon Smith theorem tells us that any Riemannian three sphere contains embedded minimal two spheres. So it makes sense to consider the functional that is the infimum of the area of all embedded two spheres that are minimal. Two spheres, right? 
And actually, this number is less or equal than the value of the width. OK? Uh, so the observation is that under the assumption star, those two numbers coincide. But this number has a, an advantage with respect to this. So as a function on the space of the matrix, the width is better than A for the following reason. So the width is continuous on the space of matrix, but A is not. Right? So you can imagine uh, creating like a nose in the round sphere. It will not change the width. But if the nose gets up, you get a minimal two sphere here, which has area less than the width. Right? So suddenly, a minimal sphere has appeared with much less area. So in, I mean, in technical, from the technical side, uh, the width seems to be nicer. OK. OK, so now let me get back to uh, this analogy, right? So what I would like to do now is to see, to study um, the relations between the volume of the trees here and the width. So the problem I want to address is study the normalized width. Um, so the width is uh, area, so it scales like lambda square. So I have to divide by the volume to 2 divided by 2. Okay, so I want to study the normalized width on the space of matrix. OK, so if you think about the ellipsoids, if you make them more and more elongated, it's easy to conclude that this number can be made arbitrarily small, close to 0. Right? Because if you fix the, the section of the ellipsoid, makes the volume bigger and bigger by elongating it. You keep the width fixed, the volume goes to infinity, so this goes to 0. So the interesting aspect of this question is to study upper bounds. And the first result in this direction, I think, is this result of tribex dealing with convex spheres in a fall. <coughs> so tribex showed in 85, uh, the following. Uh, there exists a constant uh, such that uh, for every three sphere that is isometrically <coughs> embedded into the Euclidean four dimensional space as the boundary of a convex set, as the boundary of a convex set, so that for every pa -pa -pa, I have the width of these trees here is bounded from above by C times the volume to the right power, to divide by 3. OK, so in this particular class of matrix, there is an upper bound. So, as, so since they are boundaries of convex sets, they have no negative sectional curvature. And let me mention that this constant in his theorem is not sharp. So it's an open question to determine 
the sharp constant. It's an explicit constant. The constant is explicit, but not sharp. Okay. So what is open is to compute the sharp constant. Open to compute well, I guess. sharp c. Yes. So when you say it is not sharp, do you mean that it is known not to be sharp, or he expects to be it to be sharp? No. So he's not able to no. Do he it. he himself was already aware okay. that this was not the sharpest constant. He made a conjecture about. Sure. I can imagine that. Do you want to say that? <laughs> okay, so mm, no, 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 no. So this is a funny thing. So let me very quickly uh, okay. So I will try to explain. So. It's not supposed to be achieved by a smooth metric. And the idea would be the following. So imagine I have a, the z equals 0 plane. And that here I have a, the regular tetra tetrahedron. OK? And then take a, take a, a tubular neighborhood of that. In a four, a tubular neighborhood. Uh, so this is the tetrahedron T. Uh, K is going to be T epsilon. Tubular neighborhood. And um, so the the, the sphere, right? This is going to be the the boundary of this K. Okay, th this is not smooth yet, but you can make it. I mean. Your computations, you can make the arrow as small as you want. Um, and if you, right, right, so what's the guess, right? So the guess is that, so if you sweep out like by, by, by those planes containing the x4 axis and, and parallel to this height, okay, uh, this figure, f this uh, tubular neighborhood would have a two-dimensional sphere belonging to a, that is a maximum a slice of this sweep out that is like twice this, tri this, this two sphere here. OK, you have to imagine. So this is a tubular neighborhood. So you are taking two copies of that and rounding the corners. And in those two copies, you would have this doubled, forming a two sphere, and up to a error. And this would belong to a, it would be a, ma a candidate to estimate the width. OK? So if you compute the double of the area of that and divide by the double of the area of the standard tetrahedron, you get a number that is slightly bigger than the number of the round metric. So this suggests, um, yeah, this is a suggestion that the round metric is not the maximizing metric. OK? And so is, you probably said that the constant C gets just by considering sweep outs by planes, right? Yes, so I would say two sentences. And as soon as somebody says, look, as I got you, then I will stop. Okay. So the two sentences are Crofton formula and Minkowski inequality. So exactly. So you are in R3. You have very natural families of sweep outs to do. You pick a direction and the horizontal plane is orthogonal to this direction. Okay? So this will give you an estimate for the width. And Crofton formula tells you that to compute the area of the boundary of this convex region, all you need to do is to compute the area of the slices of those intersections and average along all possible directions. So this gives you a very nice formula for the area and explicitly related to sweep outs, right? So using convexity, you estimate all leaves of the, the z integral of all leaves as by the, by the width. And using Brum-Minkowski, you compute, you estimate 
uh, the length of projections on lines by the right power of the area of the juice here. Uh, yeah, I can do this in more details if you if you find it interesting. Maybe. Okay, so okay. Tell me. He does it actually for R N and K dimensional sweep outs. And um, uh, the constant for the tetrahedron and the constant for the sphere. Do they get a syntactic clause at the Ah, uh, these I haven't computed. I don't know. But this is an interesting, yeah, yeah. I don't know. I'm not, I don't think I'm very good at geometry because I don't know how to compute <laughs> high dimensional <laughs> tetrahedron. Huh? Sorry? I think the other paper of Berard where he just takes any manifold, he uses the first eigenfunctions functions embedded. In the Euclidean space? Almost uh -huh. automatically into the Euclidean space, and so then the hyperplane just becomes the mm -hmm. intersection with the nodal sets, and there you compute the average area. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, yeah, this is, it's the same idea. Yeah, this is a similar idea, exactly. OK, so le let, me, let, me, let me go on the next, to the next topic, and maybe I go back to this proof later. So, okay, so we have a nice family of three spheres with positive sectional curvature for which the width is bounded from above by this constant time the body. And maybe you could ask, well, how about metrics with positive Ricci? Uh, do they also satisfy this? And the computation we did together shows that this is not true. So, the computation we did uh, is a computation on Berger spheres. So let me uh, identify this here with this subset of the two-dimensional uh, complex plane. And let me define this vector field that multiplies a point on the sphere by i. So this vector field is the generator of the Hopf action. <coughs> by S1. And the Berger metric is a metric that deforms the size of this particular direction. So the Berger metric uh, G ho at two vectors x and y is given by the Euclidean metric of those two the Euclidean inner product of those two vectors plus whole square minus 1 times x psi y psi. OK, so observe that for this new metric, psi has no square equals to rho square. And the orthogonal complement doesn't change. So this family of metrics is very nice because things are very explicit. So for example, you can compute the isometry group uh, as dimension 4. So the metric is very homogeneous. Um, the volume is just rho times the volume of S3. And I think nowadays everyone knows that this volume is 2 pi square times rho. And also, you can explicitly check that sigma 0 given by the horizontal slice, so zw in S3, such that the imaginary part of w is equal to 0. So this guy is a minimum two sphere. Okay, and this guy is unique up to ambient isometries. So, claim in a BG sphere, any two embedded minimal two spheres are isometric to each other by ambient isometry. So this is a result by Abresh 
and roll it back. <coughs> Unique up to a zone. OK. OK, so we have all we need to compute the normalized width, right? Because by the min max theorem and this uniqueness result, uh, the normalized width is going to be the area of this particular sphere divided by, by the volume. And let me show you the graph of the normalized width. So yeah, let me draw it here. Uh, so the graph in terms of rho of w divided by the volume to the two thirds. Uh, so one is the round metric. What is the range of rho? Rho goes from z pl zero to plus infinity. Uh, yeah, okay. okay. And so the value of the normalized width of the round metric is is what? 4 pi divided by 2 pi squared to the power 2 thirds, which is the cubic root of 16 pi, 16 over pi. And the graph is a bit surprising. So do you expect the, them to be above or below the round metric? So the answer is that they are actually above. OK, so they go from plus infinity to the round metric then they go up again. OK, and this, this graph is very interesting, because in this regime, for rho less or equal than square root of 2, the, po the reach is positive. OK? And if you go from 0 to 2, the scalar curvature is positive. But in this region, the reach is not positive. And here, the scalar curvature is negative. OK, so we see there are extremely nice metrics, even with positive rich curvature, with arbitrarily large and uh, normalized width. OK? And moreover, the sphere cannot be a local maximum in the space of metrics, because there are nearby Bezier spheres with larger uh, normalized width. Sorry, comparing to the drive, Drivers. Yes. What is the region where you have positive section of the Ah, uh, no. The no Berger spheres, except the round one. OK, so for row different than one, you cannot isometrically embed a Berger sphere as a hypersurface in R4. And Tribex theorem is about hypersurfaces of R4. Sure. OK? So the Berger spheres, you need more, more dimension, more dimensions to embed it into the Euclidean space. So the Bezier spheres are really but how about outside. Is it just the uh, I actually don't remember, but maybe somebody, oh, I don't know. Well, okay. the size of the, so rho is the size of the hop fibers. When rho goes to 0, you are converging to a sphere, a two-dimensional sphere. You are collapsing to a two-dimensional sphere. So I guess that as you collapse, I, I'm not sure. I, I'm afraid that, no, this is not true, right? I, I don't know, yeah. So let me not make a, a claim. OK. OK. OK, so um, let me now, OK, so yeah, I have time. So let's go try back still. So, uh, let me, yeah, let me prove it here. OK. OK, so proof. OK, so sketch. Tribex. So I have S, 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 3, G, the boundary convex set. and. For simplicity, well, it doesn't really matter because I can pass to the limits. Let's assume the sectional curvature is positive everywhere. So it's really convex. OK, so the 
two sentence uh, Crofton formula, which tells us that the volume of the boundary of the convex set is equal up to a constant, C1, to um, so I will compute the area of every intersection of the boundary of K of my domain with a plane. And this over the space of uh, three dimensional planes. OK, so this is a formula in integral <coughs> geometry. <coughs> Right, so this space we can parameterize by the Grassmannian. So we can pick, well, for every direction, L, oriented direction, say, uh, we look at all planes orthogonal to this particular direction, and we can compute those two dimensional areas along this family. So let me say this is the, my compact set, and I will compute the area of the intersections of K with this, this family of parallel planes. OK? So let me write here. So this is going to be um, equal to C2, well, the set of directions, S3. And then from minus infinity to plus infinity, which is actually a finite inti integral because you integrate on this projection here, right? So this projection we will denote PL of K, the one-dimensional set of H2 dK intersected with uh, T times V plus P. OK, v, v, v is the direction parallel to L. OK, I'm translating the plane pi, which is the orthogonal complement of L by t times v. OK, so now let's see the maximum slice. Uh, so in this picture, it's going to be some, somewhere maybe maybe here. OK? And the area of this guy is an upper bound for the width, OK, by the definition of the width. And the game is to compare the area of this guy with the area of the, the, the other, with all these areas, right? Because this formula involves all those areas. So and the, the idea is very simple, because if you pick the, the tip and you do the cone of it, there w for each slice in between, right? this slice will be outside a rescaled version of the maximum slice. But this guy is a convex set, right? The section of a plane of a convex set. So this guy is also a convex set. And you know convex sets are outer minimizing. So anybody that any other convex uh, surface that encloses a convex surface has more area than this interior surface. So in other words, we can do a kind of estimate like this. So let's say the tip is, parameter is the, si the time 0. This tip is time t. And then for all t less than capital T, for example, uh, the area of dk with tv plus pi should be uh, greater or equal than a, a, a factor, so which is, I think, if I'm not mistaken, uh, this one of the area of the maximum slice. So this is the maximum slice. OK? And this, of course, is greater than the t times t squared times the width. OK, so in what you do, integrate that over this projection. So if you do things carefully, it's not difficult to show that you get another constant. This integral is greater than another constant times the integral over 
um, the Grasmanians of uh, well, RP, 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 RP4, the line, the set of all lines of uh, the one dimensional size of the projection. So H1, H1, H is the house of measure. So H1 of the projection of K onto the line. Okay? And now you use Minkowski inequality. So Minkowski. So Minkowski inequality says that the average of those one-dimensional projections is at least a constant times, oh, I forgot the width here, so sorry. But this particular integral here is at most, is at uh, least um, the volume of the boundary, so the volume of the S3 to the power one third. Okay, and this ends the story because I get the power two over three. Okay. Okay. So. Okay. So before we. Okay. So in order to make the interval, let me just state um, the theorem that I will want to to discuss in the second part of the talk. Well, one of the theorems. So, right. So we we lost our hopes of getting a uniform upper bound for the normalized width, but we know that for certain metrics there is an upper bound, right? And what are the natural classes of metrics, right? So maybe those are considered by tribags, maybe those with positive Ricci. Well, maybe those in a side a conformal class. This is a setting that works well for the first Laplace eigenvalue, two. So we questioned, our question was, well, given a conformal class, can we maximize, get an upper bound for the normalized width inside the conformal class? And the positive answer that we got is for the conformal class of the round metric. So assume a three uh, three sphere that is conformally flat and has positive reach. Okay, so this is defining a large open set of metrics containing the round metric. Then uh, the width of this metric is at most the width of the round metric. <coughs> And the quality holds if and only if the metric G is wrong. OK, so maybe this is a, a good point to stop. Unfortunately, I don't know the answer. Even for the, even for the conformal class of the round metric. <coughs> no, so for the conformal of the round metric with positive reach. So what, what did you prove Yeah, uh, you have yeah, yeah. proved for the Almgren pits, but it's very interesting actually because the problem is that. When the size of the Hopf fiber goes to zero, the Almgren pits min max will pick up not the sphere, but the cliff of torus. And the cliff of torus has area going like this. So for the Almgren pits uh, width, Yevgeny has proven that there is an upper bound, uniform upper bound for the normalized Almgren pits width among metrics with positive reach. Okay? So, but on, on a given conformal class, people maximize the first 
they, they do. They do. Attack. Yeah. El Sufi. Yes. Yes. And there is, I mean, and there is banned from above by the. Uh, yes. Somehow. Yes. Somehow. Uh, yes. But uh, at the moment, I think we we can only answer this this uh, this particular set. Exactly. This is an open subset. This is actually interesting. You are not taking the old five. Yes. yes, I'm not taking the yeah. This is saying that the round metric is a local maximum, local maximum, in the conformal class. Okay. Mm -hmm. Would you expect a similar characterization for the rest of the I would. Yes. For reasons that I will discuss more in the second part. Um, OK, so now I want to explain you how to prove this theorem. Uh, right, so if you, I will use a notation, right? So the conformal class, I will denote between brackets, and a matrix conformal flat, it belongs to uh, the conformal class of the round metric. So G1 is the round metric. OK, so the first ingredient is geometric flow, so the Yamabe flow. Uh, well, the normalized Yamabe uh, flow, which is defined. So I will start at the given metric, and I will flow in this particular direction given by a multiple of the matrix, so because I want to stay inside the conformal class. And this multiple is um, the average over S3 of the scalar curvature at time gt minus the scalar curvature at time z. OK, so. And this flow was introduced by Hamilton because it is the gradient flow, or minus the gradient flow, of the Yamabe functional on a given conformal class. So this is minus gradient flow of um, the functional, the Yamabe functional that takes, computes the total integral curvature and divide by the volume to 1 over 3, OK? Minus the gradient flow of this on a conformal class. OK, so this flow was introduced to find metrics with constant uh, scalar curvature. Uh, and actually, the first theorem on the subject, the first published theorem on the subject, is the theorem that we used. It's the theorem by Shaw. So Shaw proves the following. So if you start at a conformally flat metric, then, so it's the initial, right? Uh, so if you start if, uh, at a, the conformal class of the round metric, then the flow uh, exists for all times and converges as the time goes to infinity to a round metric, to the round, to a round metric, OK? Uh, as t goes to infinity. Remember that in the conformal class of the round metric, uh, there is only one metric with constant scalar curvature, but the conformal factor is I mean, the, the round sphere has a conformal group. So yeah, l never mind. So this converts to the round metric. And Shaw also proved uh, uh, that the bridge curvature, the positive bridge curvature, is a preserved curvature condition. So he shows that if the initial metric has positive bridge curvature, then all metrics have positive bridge curvature. OK? 
which is good for us because remember, positive rich matrix satisfy property star, right? So the min max number will be realized by an object that we understand very well. It's a minimal embedded two sphere of index one. Okay. Uh, this is the first ingredient. So the second ingredient is a formula for the derivative of the width. So the width, as a function on the space of matrix, is continuous, but not differentiable. However, if you go along a smooth path of matrix, uh, the width is a locally Lipschitz function. Particularly, you can differentiate, differentiate it almost everywhere. right? And so let me write down the heuristics of the formula. Uh, and then I will formalize that later. So derivative of the width. And the idea is that, uh, OK, so let's imagine a, an ideal situation, which is just a heuristic, right? That as I vary the metric, gt, the mean max sphere that realizes the width is also varying continuously. So let's imagine that this is true to try to guess what should be the formula for the derivative of the width. Well, if this, there is this family of surfaces that are minimal and realizing the width, uh, then the derivative of the width should be the derivative of this function, right? But observe, so you could interpret it as a function of two variables. Uh, so the derivative in the first variable is to vary the surface for a given metric. And the derivative of the in the second value is to fix the surface and study how the metric varies, how the area varies as the metric varies. Uh, and the good thing is that sigma is minimal. So the derivative in the first variable is going to be 0. OK, so d dt, so the derivative of the width should be something like uh, the half the trace so the half of the integral over sigma of the trace of the velocity vector along sigma with respect to the area. OK? So this, this is the heuristic, <coughs> which I will justify rigorously somehow later. <coughs> and finally, what's the last ingredient? Is an index estimate for Sorry, it's an estimate for index 1 minimal 2 spheres. So for index 1 minimal 2 spheres. Uh, because notice, so we want to apply this for the that particular variation. So what we want to compute somehow the integral of the scalar curvature. So we need an estimate for that. And it's very standard computation, using, by the way, the same techniques that you can use to prove Hurst theorem, to show that the scalar curvature, the ambient scalar curvature, integrated over sigma is at most 24 pi. OK? OK, so let's try to put those three pieces of information together and prove the theorem. OK, uh, so let me start normalizing things. So assume, without laws of generality, that the volume of the initial metric, the, of the given metric, is equal to the volume of the standard sphere with second coverage 1. OK? So what I want to prove now, since this is going to be 2 pi square, what I want to prove that omega, uh, w is at most 4 pi. OK, so this is what I want to prove. So the first step is to rule out this being bigger than 4 pi. OK? Right, so now let's introduce the flow. So we pick that metric and flow. 
at the beginning. So I want to draw the graph of the width. So I know that at the end, I'm converting to the round metric with volume 2 pi squared. So the width of the limit is going to be 4 pi. And I'm starting at a level above 4 pi. So what I know for sure is that whatever graph I see, it will have a maximum. Which could be exactly, which could be t equals zero. But the good thing is that we know the sign of the derivative of uh, uh, w, even at the, at the e even if tau were uh, the initial one. Okay, so uh, flow, okay, flow. I uh, normalize my flow, and then let's use the, this formula here. So okay, so at a maximum. The derivative is negative. <coughs> Which means that there is some uh, index one minimal two sphere whose area is equal to the width such that the derivative is equal to half the trace of the variation, the direction of I'm varying. So the trace of g is 2, so all I get is half uh, the integral, the average of the scalar curvature minus rg. Uh, d, dj. OK, by 2. Good. But now this is a. Uh, mean max is sphere, right? So a sphere with area equals to the width and the index 1, mean max sphere. So uh, this is a constant. So I get the area, so the, 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 which is the width, uh, times this average is less or equal than the integral of Rg, which by 3. This by 2. This by 3 is less or equal than uh, 24 pi. OK? So now we need to use uh, the fact that the flow is a graded flow. OK? So I, I forgot to mention, but um, since this functional is scaling invariant, the gradient flow will preserve the volume. So all those metrics GT have the same volume. And it's a gradient flow. So I'm going in the direction of decreasing the functional. OK? So I'm going in the direction of decreasing the integral of the scalar curvature. OK? In other words, I can estimate this from below by the integral of the scalar curvature of the limit, or the average, which is 6, right? And this number, by assumption, oh, sorry, I'm forgetting the taus. Uh, OK? So this is a tau, a tau, a tau, a tau. Uh, and tau, and tau, and this is bigger, so it's a maximum, so this is bigger than uh, the initial, the width of So maybe this is visually a bit confusing, but if you divide by 6, you would be getting um, uh, the, the, the width of the initial matrix is less or equal than 4 pi, contradiction. OK? Any questions? So where do you look at that, which is positive? Uh, okay. For this formula. Because you want to make sure that there's only one guy? I want to realize the derivative as the integral over a single sphere of index 1. Because otherwise, I will have a combination. And this integral would be far worse. I have no control. No, no, no sharp control on that. Ah, by, by assumption, right? Because this is tau is the point of maximum. Yeah, yeah. The, the assumption that the guy is greater than four pi was just to guarantee that I achieve a maximum. Oh, 
as you say, because I, I could have a feature like this, and then I have no maximum, no, no point to, to differentiate. OK? So this point here uses star or positive reach. OK? And, and, and you see why was it important to for the positive reach to be preserved condition? OK? A question that I don't know, although I would expect to be false, is that the condition starts not preserved by Ricci, by Yamabe flow. Right? Because this is not true even for the Ricci flow by the root of Antoine. So yeah, anyway. OK, so we ruled out this inequality. So all that remains to prove is to, uh, to study, analyze the rigid case. So study, analyze, analyze. Uh, what happens if I start at a guy with, with 4 pi? Well, then, by the case A, if I flow, the width is never going to be bigger than 4 pi. So the initial metric is a maximum. OK? So this analysis that I did at time tau holds for time t equals 0. So by the previous. Uh, this inequality here is true at time 0. OK, but now I'm assuming this is 4 pi, which means that the This average is less or equal than 6. But it's bigger than equal to 6 because the flow is decreasing. And the value of this at this sphere, at infinity, is 6. So actually, this implies that the quality holds. And now we are finished because of Obata's result. So Obata tells us that if you minimize the Yamabe function on the conformal class of the round metric, you must be round. OK? The conclusion follows from Obata. Yes, <laughs> exactly. OK. Any questions? So the metric, ah, yes, if you are outside the, the conformally flat matrix. Yeah, I, I, I actually, I don't know. Shao only proves this, that rich positive is preserved in the conformal class of the round metric because uh, the formulas get much simpler if you kill the, I mean, the non-conformal terms, yeah. So, and, uh, and I couldn't find any, any other results on this direction. OK. OK, so we have shown this theorem which tells us that uh, the round metric <coughs> is a local maximum of the normalized width in its conformal class. OK? And this is a unique maximum, which suggests that if I perturb the conformal class a bit, I should also see a local maximum. Do you agree with this statement? If I have a local maximum and I perturb this a bit, I should also expect to see a local maximum. Mm -hmm. So this begs the question, right? So OK, it seems that there are lots of conformal classes where we can find local maxima of the normalized width. How do they look like? OK, and this is the question I want to, to address now. Um, 
and this is theorem B. Let's assume it's a conditional theorem. Let's assume uh, that this metric is a local maximum of the normalized width in its conformal class. So What's the Euler-Lagrange equation for, for that? Okay, but the Euler-Lagrange equation is the following. Then there exists a sequence sigma i of embedded minimal two spheres. with area. Notice that I'm not making the assumption star, right? So if area at most, w, and index. At most one, such that, okay, so bear with me, the statement's long. So for all functions in S3, if I want to compute, uh, if I want to compute the average value of this function, then what I need to do is the following. So I compute the integral of f over each individual sigma i in this sequence. Then I divide by the sum of the areas uh, then I sum from one to k and then I take the limit as k goes to infinity. Okay? Which you recognize is the equidistribution formula of Max Neves and so on. A sort, sort of, right? The difference that all minimal surfaces in involved are spheres with low index and low area. Okay, so let's derive two easy corollaries from that. Uh, so yeah, let me maybe let me erase Berger. Uh, corollary. The first one is that there are a um, local maximizing metric has lots and lots of minimal juices. So through each point, <coughs> passes are embedded minimal to a sphere. Of index, letter of the null, and area. Okay, so this is because if I take a neighborhood and if all those minimal surfaces avoided that neighborhood, I could put a test function supported that neighborhood that would contradict this formula. Right? Because this would be non zero, but since no minimal surface is passing through that neighborhood, this would be zero. So in every neighborhood, you have a minimal surface. Using uh, standard compactness theorem theorems, for example, Ben Sharp's theorem, you can pass to the limit and show this statement. Okay. Uh, okay. So there are plenty of them. And then the second corollary I want to state is about metrics that satisfy star. So if, moreover. Uh, S3G satisfies star. OK, 
Okay, so which means by 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 property star, all those minimal two series must have area equal to w and index equal to one by by property star. The, uh, uh, so, so if this is true and um, and the Yamabe class, the Yamabe type, sorry, of this conformal class is positive, then the following inequality holds. The normalized width is at most 24 pi divided by the Yamabe invariant of the class. So the Yamabe invariant of the class is the infimum of the functional in this class. Okay. So, sorry. Uh, maybe you already said that, I not that, but in particular, remark one implies that any maximizing metric is non generic, right? Perfect, exactly, yes. And then. Uh, they are non bumpy, which you write, so they are rare somehow. They are you rare. don't expect to find them. But on the mm -hmm. other hand, uh, I'm trying to combine it with the heuristics you were giving before that a priori one would expect a neighborhood of metrics so that there is persistence. Of that phenomenon, like of the ah, but yeah, but the neighborhood is going outside the conformal class. I'm uh, that that heuristic was about uh, you having a maximizing metric in a given conformal class yeah. and moving the conformal class. Right, but doesn't that apply? Doesn't your theorem be also apply to? Uh, priori conformal classes that are close to the round one? Like yeah, yes, yes, yes. I would, yes, that uh, so, but on, on seems the to be the heuristic. You mm -hmm. may be tempted to get a whole neighborhood, but on the other hand, you are, you are saying that it's non-generic. No, but not, it's a property of a given particular metric, right? So it's not, I mean, a ah, given okay, metric so is a local maximum, ah, see, and then see, inside okay. the conformal class, and then, so they yeah. May be far. Okay. They may be, f yeah, they, so the well. So conformal class is close, but the metric is far. Uh, some, uh, well, well, you can imagine, this, this yeah, is the yeah, space yeah, of okay. matrix okay. with volume one. Okay. This is a given conformal class, and the picture of the width is like this. And yeah. for a nearby conformal class, the picture of the width is going to be like this. Yeah, 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 yeah. So you have a local maximum here, which is this one, and a local maximum here, that is one. Okay. So. Yeah, so I, I don't, I wouldn't dare to do to, to this conjecture. I would dare to conjecture that the second width is equal to the first width, but not more than that. So remember the analogy, right? So W is the first eigenvalue, and the minimal surfaces are the eigenfunctions. Uh, if you know about the theory of maximizing matrix of lambda 1, you know that a maximizing metric necessarily has multiplicity in lambda 1. So the first again value has multiplicity. So you should expect similar thing here, right? And this indicates, this goes in this direction, right? So a maximizing metric should have many, many, many minimal suites. The multiplicity of the first eigenvalue value should be bigger than 1. But I don't expect to the multiplicity to be the maximum allowed. It could be less. This happens for again functions. Okay. Okay. Uh, so yeah. So yeah. Let, let, let me try to to focus on this because I find it quite interesting, right? Because you are relating. Uh, the normalized width of a conformal class, potentially with the Yamabe invariant, right? So maybe this is something nice to be investigated. Anyway, the proof in one line is the following. So we have freedom to choose which f we can put in this formula. In particular, we can put f 
equals to this. OK, this is a function with zero average. So if you put this, this side, this side is going to be 0, OK? Which means that this side is also 0, which means that at least one of those minimal surfaces is such that the integral of that particular function is negative, OK? Otherwise, you, uh, it's, it's non positive, OK? <laughs> but then you are exactly in this situation, OK? You repeat the proof. And you get this inequality. So plug f equals the average. OK? OK. OK, so now I want to explain the mechanism behind uh, this theorem. Ah, by the way, it's important to remark which is related to the question you have again asked. Uh, we checked that all Berger spheres, and actually all homogeneous matrix, do satisfy the conclusions of this theorem. Okay? In an homogeneous matrix, the mean max spheres are equidistributed in that sense. And they also satisfy this, and they also satisfy this. So, which indicates that homogeneous matrix should be maximizing to homogeneous matrix uh, satisfy all these conclusions. Okay. 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 So let me explain the mechanism. If you, you say you can follow that proof. Yeah, you can also follow that proof. Yes. If, if you, you if no, you but follow GT, these are Yeah, no. Yeah, as far as I can see now is you, you it's better to use yeah. I, I know for sure that using this formula you get this conclusion, but I'm not sure if you're using then Yamab flow, you can get the same conclusion. Because you don't know where it's going, the Yamab flow, right? In another conformal class. So I there could be a conformal class with several constant scalar curvature metrics. And the Yamab flow could pass through regions where property star holds, through regions where it doesn't hold. So it's a bit complicated. <laughs> OK, so key. Key. Okay, sketch. And I will do the sketch, assuming it satisfies a uh, star. OK. So let's rephrase the, let's see how this statement looks like when G satisfies star. So then the minimal surface has area equal to that. The index is equal to that. And they, since they all have the same area, um, the, this, this complicated expression becomes so this is k times the width. So I can write it as follows. OK? OK, so local maximum in G. What our theorem say is that this implies a certain property of the volume measure. So <coughs> what we are doing here is we are taking a convex combination 
of the measures that are the average of f over a min max surface. OK, so this is a convex combination of those measures. And we are taking the limit over all f. So this limit is in the weak star sense. And so we are, what, what this condition means is that the volume element belongs to the weak star closure. It's a complicated sentence. So the weak star closure of the convex hull of the cone over the min max spheres of the measures associated to the min-max sphere. Sorry for that. It's a long sentence, but this is what it means. So dvg belongs to the weak star uh, closure of the convex who of the positive cone over the Hadon measures integral of sigma, uh, so yeah, mi, mu f equals integral of the sigma, sigma, I mean max g. OK, do I, is that more or less clear? So I say a cone because it can pass. So I'm talking about the volume element, right? So this I'm multiplying by the volume. So this guy is a this guy is a positive multiple of this Radon measure. And then I'm taking convex combinations and taking the limit. Okay. And how how do we get from here to here? Hmm? We follow the technique that we learned in the paper by Alana and Rick, where they were studying the similar problem for the stack of eigenvalues. So, right, so if this metric G is a local maximum, by definition, whenever I take a family uh, starting at G naught, at G, sorry, starting at G, a smooth family, such that the volume is kept fixed. Uh, okay, so whenever we get this sort of family, uh, we must see the width decreasing, right? By definition of local maximum. If the volume is kept the same, I mean at a maximum of the width over the volume, so the width cannot increase, it will not increase. So this inequality holds. Okay, But as I said, GT is a smooth family of metrics. And the width is very like a Lipschitz function on T, a locally Lipschitz function. So I can use, for example, the fundamental theorem of calculus in the, uh, to express the difference. Oh, sorry. Yeah, yeah. To express the difference as the integral of the derivatives, which exists almost everywhere because the function is Lipschitz. And that integral is going to be negative. right? So almost every point where the derivative exists must have negative derivative. This is what. So, okay, so this is Lipschitz. Uh, and so uh, there exists a sequence of tau i is going to 0. Uh, where uh, the width uh, is differentiable at tau i, and the derivative is negative. At this particular tau i. But remember, the derivative, we, I gave you a formula for that. So the heuristic formula, which I need to justify yet. But this heuristic formula would tell us that this derivative is half the trace of the speed of the variation 
é tal i d3 over a min max surface a min max steer ok ok, so this is uh, uh, an intermediate step and then we use compactness so we have a sequence of index 1 minimal spheres with bounded area we can pass to the limit they will converge as varifolds so uh, this integral here goes to infinity and in the conclusion I am asserting that there exists uh, there exists sigma a uh, min max surface so those min max surfaces are in g tau i but now I get a min max surface a min max sphere in S3 G, the initial metric, such that uh, the integral of the trace of the speed at zero is negative. Okay, and then I'm almost there, so right, so okay, so this is true. I forgot something. I forgot something crucial. This is only true when GT belongs to the conformal class, right? Of course, I'm assuming it's a local maximum inside the conformal class. So, the point is, what are the infinitesimal directions? What are the possible values of this trace? Right? And then it's an easy lemma. For every function of zero average, you can build a family starting at the given G that stays inside the conformal class, that keeps the volume fixed, and that has that uh, function as the, as the speed. Okay? In other words, this whole summary of this, those steps is to say that for every function, well, every smooth function, say, in S3, such that the average, the integral, is 0 over S3, there exists a min max surface such that this measure associated to sigma gives a negative, a non-positive number at this given f. Okay? And now let's think about this statement. So how, what kind of tool, tools do we have to distinguish when a, a vector belongs to a cone or, or not? Huh? So I have to remember the Hambanach theorem. Okay. The Hambanach theorem tells us that if this guy does not belong to this big set, then there is a separating hyperplane. So now, Hambanek. Hambanek. Um, so I assume, so this is the impressionistic representation of the set K. Expressionistic. Expre oh, maybe it's better. Yeah, the expressionistic. Ex <laughs> <laughs> so K, K is the set of those measures, uh, integral over sigma. OK, this is the cone over it. And um, I'll assume by contradiction that dvg is outside the cone. Well, this means that there is going to be a hyperplane, which is well, uh, the topology is the weak star topology, right? So the hyperplanes are determined by functions. So there is a hyperplane determined by f, such that dvg of f is positive. And uh, Uh, so yeah, let, let me write less an integral. So the integral of f in dvg is positive, and this integral is zero for all min max sigma. Okay, so I'm doing an argument by contradiction. So if this is not true. 
we would find such f. But now I need to contradict this statement. So this f, so instead of taking f, uh, let us consider uh, the average, or maybe in this direction, uh, minus f. So this particular f is such that the integral over s3 is 0. But the integral over a given mean max surface, I'm running out of space, is going to be what's going to be? So OK, so this is a constant, so uh, times the, the, the measure, right? So the, the area of sigma. OK, this is a constant. I'm integrating this constant over sigma. And minus, uh, minus the integral of L0. I hope, OK, so I hope this is the right. And now this is a positive number. This is a strictly positive number. Right, the integral of f is positive, strictly positive. So this is a strictly positive number. And by, by this, this is a, is a non-negative a non, a non, a non number. So this number is positive. OK? Contradiction. Because this should be true. OK, so I'm saying that for this particular f0, which has 0 area, there is, for this particular f0, which has average 0, The integral over all min max surfaces is strictly positive. But this is saying that for this particular f0, there should be at least one with the integral less or equal than 0. Contradiction. Contradiction. Is, is, the, is the geometric version of Hambanek? Uh, yeah, the statement is, is just like this. If you, if you, are, yeah, you can right. So if you have a compact set and a closed Omics. disjoint set, huh? a compact, Omics. yeah, Alessandro, yeah, please help me. <laughs> you you taught this course <laughs> recently. <laughs> well, I mean, if you have you know two convex sets disjoint, one compact, the other closed. Then you, you, you can separate them with a, with a number. With an upper plane. Okay. Which is like a linear function. Which are linear functional, yeah. defined yeah. by f because this is the weak star topology. And, and, and the picture is like this because the set that I'm separating from the point is a cone. So you can imagine any other uh, plane would intersect the cone. So <laughs> my picture is. Is realistic. <laughs> okay. So, moral of the story: If you have a min-max functional, um, a min-max, a functional that is a min-max critical point of some geometric functional that can be realized by nice objects. Uh, and you want to relate them to the volume. Uh, this approach tells you how the all Lagrangian equation should be. Okay, this is what I learned from Ilana and Enrique. Right? Do you need to assume star for this thing? Ah, right. So yeah. So then, okay. So then the min max w will be realized not by a single minimal sphere. But by a varifold that is supported by minimal two spheres with integer coefficients. So the formula here will hold true for instead of integrating these over a particular sigma, you will compute the varifold. I mean, the mass of the. You will. How, how was the terminology? You, well, we have the varifold, you compute it into this function. OK? So in the end, the weak star DVG will belong to weak star closure of the Radon measures associated to the min max varifolds instead of the min max spheres. Okay, and then actually uh, maybe I should mention this because to pass from 
here this statement to this statement, which is uh, neater, right? Uh, we we use some 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 a few things that we learned in the paper by by Andrea Fernando in, and and Antoine uh, because there is there is a um, uh, like a arithmetic procedure. I don't know how to describe it. Uh, it's a bit algebraic way to to transform to write down this condition as a nice average condition like this. Okay. So maybe, okay. Are you, do you want to know uh, how to compute the derivative? Maybe this is a, a technical point that needs some clarification. And this is going to be the last thing I say. So now we use the, 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 the condition star, right? So the condition star, as I mentioned, says that any min max is here. By the way, Lucas, yes? what you're about to say, isn't there a very similar result by coding min cost in the, uh, in the paper on extinction time for each flow? Like, they also need to, to, to prove, like, a yeah, a formula for the derivative yeah, somehow. Exactly, exactly. Like, like it's yeah. essentially the same. It's the same. Yeah, exactly, I mean exactly. The flow is different, but, but somehow you're doing the same thing. Exactly. I agree. I agree. In the computation of the derivative, I mean, we didn't invent that. It's, it's how to compute derivatives of Lipschitz functions, if you want, using a comparison method. So the, the point is that every mean max uh, sphere under, under star Every min max sphere belongs to to our optimal sweep out uh, such that if I plot the graph of the area of sigma s, then I see something that is strictly convex here, and then it's small, it's smaller. Okay, so every min max sphere belongs to our optimal sweep out and you have a strict local maximum uh, there. So the idea is to, well, if we perturb this picture, we will find a family of spheres, depending on, on, on t, uh, such that the area of those spheres uh, with respect to the very metric is actually the maximum of the areas in this family, OK? So we are fixing the family, varying the metric. And what I'm saying is that there is a, a smooth determination of the maximum, the slice with maximum area. And but, but this is good, because uh, since I'm taking a competitor, I can estimate this from below by the width, OK? So I have a function that is above the width that coincides with the width at the given point. And so if this point is a point where the derivative of this exists, the derivative is going to be the same as the derivative of that. And, and then we are almost back to the heuristic. OK, so maybe that's, that's all I want to take.